paper which looked at uh, the uh, effect of GPS tagging on, on the behavior and the marine distribution of the birds. And uh, that's a, a study with uh, uh, several co-authors, in, including um, Adam Seward and, and Mark Bolton from RSPB. And uh, today to discuss the paper, we have uh, Rachel Taylor from the British Trust for Ornithology um, with us. And uh, we, we, we picked this, uh, this paper because uh, when we, when we track seabirds or any animal with electronic tags, uh, of course, we constantly worry about potential uh, detrimental effects to, to the birds. Uh, first and, and foremost, because we, we worry about the, the, the well-being of the animal, but also that uh, because if, if the bird is handicapped, this uh, obviously will affect the results we are, we are getting. And uh, as, as you know, there's a flurry of device impact studies uh, in the bibliography and, and also recent synthesis, such as the paper by uh, Tom Bodhi and, and colleagues. But few analyses looked at uh, device effects on the spatial ecology of, of wild animals. And that's simply because if you do not equip a bird with a GPS tag, for instance, well, of course, you can't track it um, and you don't know where it has been, especially if it's an oceanic seabird. Uh, one way to address this is, is to compare tracking data with uh, ship-based surveys, uh, as uh, Clara Perron, for instance, did for Yelkwanshir waters in the Mediterranean. But uh, with ship-based surveys, you only get uh, general distribution patterns and not actual tracks. So the, the whole thing appeared to me as an unsolvable problem, uh, but the authors of the 10th study um, looked at this uh, and, and they bypassed this problem in what I think is a very elegant uh, if dangerous manner. Um, they, they studied Arctic terns during the breeding season at the Skerries in Wales. And if you don't know where Wales is, then I cannot do anything for you. Um, they, they GPS tracked uh, 18 individuals uh, using three gram tags, so about 3% of the body mass of the terns. But at the, at the same time, they were also following uh, about 80 other individuals during their trip at sea. And, and they did this directly by following them with a, a high-powered, rigid-held inflatable boat. So that's a very long name for something which can make you immensely seasick or eventually kill you. Uh, so I, I, I watched footages of uh, Bernard Cadieu using this uh, same method to track turns in Brittany, and it looked like complete madness. Um, Interestingly, the, the authors found that the at-sea home ranges and, and core foraging areas of birds followed by boat were nested within those uh, as determined through GPS tracking. That's really interesting and it means that GPS-based home ranges and, and foraging areas were similar but slightly wider than those determined by uh, risking their lives on, on horrible boats. And uh, this, this could be due either to uh, GPS track birds being slightly handicapped and, and foraging more widely, or more likely to uh, visual observations from the boat not covering the, enter, the entire at sea home range of the birds uh, because of uh, these technique being limited by sea state. Uh, obviously, you cannot ride these boats when the sea is too rough. Um, but that's not everything uh, in this study. The, the authors did another really cool thing. They, they compared um, chick provisioning rates for three groups of turns. The first group of turns were caught and, and fitted with a GPS tag and a leg flag for individual identification. A second group um, was handled and only marked uh, with a leg flag. And a third group had been, had been marked with a leg flag in the previous year but was not handled in the year of the study. And, and they found that chick provisioning rates of individuals fitted with both GPS and leg flags and those fitted with a leg flag alone were lower than for those of unhandled control birds. But this difference only became visible after uh, 48 hours uh, post capture. Um, and at the level of the pair, the birds compensated for lower provisioning rate of one member of the pair and, uh, and in this context, it, it seems uh, wise to only equip one member of the pair. So I, I, I really like both parts of the study. And, uh, and the second point to something I've often been wondering about in the field, sometimes it seems that catching the bird is actually what has the strongest impact and, and not necessarily the tagging itself, uh, of course, within reason. 
and uh, and so I, I wanted to ask Rachel uh, as a first question what she thinks about this and what were her impressions in, in the field about handling and, and tagging the birds? Yes, that actually was one of the more surprising findings of this study. So um, we, when we started out, we started out effectively with a pilot study because we were interested to see whether terns of this low body weight could be safely GPS tagged. And the Skerries colony, because it has um, some very good vantage points, offers an opportunity to do detailed observation in season in a turn colony that's simply not possible in most turn colonies that I've spent time in. So, you know, we could group three nests um, and look down on them from relatively close and get some really good behavioral observational data. Um, the, the effect of catching or the apparent effect of catching I find very very interesting so the the team I'm one of the people that was catching and tagging the birds in fact I did all the tagging and another very experienced seabird worker was um, doing the catching because you can't do everything um, and we have been tagging birds in that colony since I think 2012 um, and we've built up a sort of a reasonable set of experience. We use walk-in traps um, and monitor agitation in the birds and obviously go and remove them if we see any agitated behaviour. The walk-in traps are sized actually such that Arctic tern don't bounce around in them. They fit the birds very well and as soon as a bird lifts its wings it tends to keep still because it finds the sides of the trap so they don't crash around inside. Um, so I find it very difficult to explain the, the difference for birds that weren't instrumented, that weren't um, GPS tagged. Um, if anybody else has any suggestions for that, you know, I'd appreciate them. We're doing long term survival monitoring in this colony and we saw no difference in survival rates between birds that had been GPS tagged in the previous year. Um, and obviously we saw their compensatory behaviour. Um, in both groups, but I really don't, I can't see what the ecological or mechanistic reason might be for a response for birds that had been flagged. Yes, but you could, you could have a, at least a short term effect of, uh, of a capture itself on, on the bird and, and not necessarily of uh, either the, the leg flag or, or, the GPS, or the GPS tag. And, and in my opinion, it would make sense that then this uh, short term effect uh, of the capture would uh, fade away, so to say, and, and uh, that you, you could not track it in, in birds which had been leg flagged the year before. Yes, um, that's true. And on release of birds, it was quite interesting that there's huge individual variation in the immediate response of a bird to capture. So um, obviously we had them for a relatively short period of time, two minutes for leg flagging and about 10 minutes for GPS tagging. Um, and some birds would be back on the nest before we could get to a vantage point to observe them. And that was across all the groups. And others would go off and just, you know, disappear, go and loaf, go and fish. Um, and not come back until they had something to bring back. So they clearly terminated that behavior with a fishing trip. Um, and they, one of the problems I think that we've encountered in this study is that however tightly you control a study that involves 10 tags um, and 20 birds with interventions of any kind, that's a relatively small number when there's high individual variation. Mm. And, and another point um, I was interested in is, is that uh, you recorded the GPS positions uh, at a rate of uh, one fix every 300 seconds. Uh, yeah. And in the methods you explain that uh, because the trips were relatively short, about 10 minutes, uh, what, what you, you did then um, was to um, 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 modify this data set so that uh, it was comparable with the at-sea observations. Um, and the direct observations from the boat. And that meant that you only compared core foraging areas and also home ranges and, and not necessarily the track characteristics. 
so I was wondering, I was wondering whether there would be a next step uh, or a next challenge in this study where you would actually try with the boat to follow birds which had been GPS tagged. Or, or, is it, or, is it, or is it completely impossible? Or, or maybe it's possible at a much smaller colony? I think it might be possible at a smaller colony. Um, so it's incredibly difficult for the staff, for the people on the boat. I mean, they, you know, they're enormously experienced at this madness and I wouldn't do it if you paid me quite a lot. Um, oh, so, so you had the same impression as, as I had? Yes, and in fact, that's one of the interesting differences between the two techniques. So on the face of it, that I, this is a byway, but on the face of it, GPS tagging looks expensive because you need very competent people to fit them. The tags are expensive. The technology is an investment. But when it works, you collect data irrespective, irrespective of weather and sea conditions. And actually, one of the things that I'd like to do in future is look at the carbon implications of the two methods because mm. those ribs use a huge amount of diesel. But that aside, um, it, when you do behavior observations in a turn colony, you realize just what a high proportion of the birds present in the colony interacting with chicks often are actually not breeding birds. They, I suspect, are sub-adults that are coming in, involving themselves in the colony, involving themselves in bringing food in, but they're not actually breeding birds and they, they tease chicks with fish and then take them off the, the chicks and eat them themselves and this sort of thing. So the, the guys on the boat could track a bird that rose from the middle of the colony and appeared to rise even from the, the near vicinity of a nest, but they couldn't know what the breeding status of those birds were. So in comparing the spatial behavior, we have multiple potential sources of bias that we tried to control for by resampling the, the boat data. So the one issue is that very short trips don't show up in the GPS data other than as blurring of the positions of the birds when they appear to be on the colony. Um, but the boat tracking can pick up those very short distances. Another is that the boat is more likely to lose birds at sea, although in the GPS data, we also lost some birds because the trips were long enough to go past the end of a period when the tag was active. Um, and the third one is this issue of the constraints on an individual bird associated with whether it's actually part of an active breeding attempt or not. And that one, you know, we, the GPS tagged birds are of known status and the boat tracked birds are really of unknown status you know, try as they can. It's a very difficult thing to identify. And, and was the, the study, um, what was the background of the study? Was it about gaining information in the context of uh, marine special planning or, or uh, of short developments in, in the area? It was rather more blue sky than that, actually. Um, oh, nice. So the, financially, the study was part supported by RSPB as part of the work that they're doing around roseate tern conservation. And they were interested in whether GPS tagging was a functional tool that was going to produce results without causing disbenefits to terns of that size. Um, and from BTO's perspective, it was an opportunity to put together as solid a study as we could on impacts of catching and tagging activities. And those impacts might be behavioural impacts on the birds, they might be impacts on the outcomes of the breeding attempts, they might be impacts on the quality of the data. And we felt that that understanding was worth some investment. Oh, very so nice. In many ways, it was a piece of blue sky research and we have quite a lot more that we could potentially do with the data. Um, but we've also learned quite a lot in the process and Although I think it's a strong paper as it is, I think if we went back to the beginning, we would probably do a couple of things slightly differently. Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly a very uh, valuable contribution. So congratulations on this. And, and I, I still have a couple of uh, questions I'll uh, maybe keep for later, but uh, I'll hand over to Grant and, and the audience for, for questions. Thanks All a right. lot. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks, Rachel. And actually, I, I might, Nina, do you have any questions you'd like to, you'd like to ask Rachel while we're here? I'll try to. There you go. Um, well, there are some wonderful questions in the chat. I think yeah. we should 
Yep, that's that's fine. And in fact, one but the question that I was going to ask was uh, was asked in the chat by Richard Bevan. Um, but I'll first I'll just quickly touch on the question that Abdumola. Abdumola, I can't pronounce your name, and I apologize desperately for that. It's my North Americanism uh, sticking out there. So uh, he's asked, can you use blood sampling from uh, tagged and untagged birds using stress hormones? Um, yeah, so I, I'm aware that this is a technique that's been used in other studies. Um, we didn't consider using it in this one, partly because the, the tag attachment method we used, glue mounts, um, is considered to be a relatively low impact method because you don't have to recapture the bird. So it's a single catching attempt after which your data collection is entirely remote and the tag falls off when the bird molts. So there's, there's definitely not going to be any long-term impact of a tag that stays on a bird when it goes into migration. Um, in many ways, it would have been interesting to consider blood sampling, but you, it would be difficult, I think, to unpick, particularly with hindsight, to unpick the stress response associated with catching um, from any stress response associated with carrying a tag for the intervening period. Uh, particularly when the birds are breeding, so they're under metabolic stress anyway. All right. Thanks a lot. And um, so the other question that we've got is from Richard Bevan, which was the question I was going to ask, which is how does the presence of the boat affect the behavior of the birds at sea? So all I can say here is from the perspective of the very experienced boat team who actually invented this technique um, and operated as consultants in marine studies around the coast of the UK. They, they've done most of it actually on the East Coast. Um, and they told me that on the East Coast, it's easier. The seas around North Wales are much less pleasant. <laughs> um, and they maintain a distance of approximately 100 meters between themselves and the bird that they're tracking. And they haven't observed any response of the birds to the presence of the boat at those distances. Um, I have to take their word from that on that, um, but it, in many ways it's reassuring that the tag data from birds that were obviously carrying tags but were otherwise not being chased around or followed um, is so similar to the data that comes from the boat tracking. You could actually, uh, you could actually use a, a visual, uh, an avian vision model to, uh, to check whether in that position and, and flying towards the sea, uh, the, the turn can actually see a boat a uh, hundred meters behind. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that would be a fun project. Interesting. There you go. It's an idea, idea for you, David. <laughs> um, there was another question in here, but I'm not sure if it was a question or a comment, which was from Lillian, who's asked lithium ion batteries in tags. I'm not sure if that's a comment or a question, Lillian. Uh, it was more like food for thought in terms of looking at the carbon footprint of diesel versus making tags and what goes in it. Just something to think about as well. But I'm not a tag manufacturer, so I don't know much about it. So. <laughs> I, I think I think it's a very valid I think it's a very valid comment because uh, on on one side, of course, you can calculate a, a carbon budget and footprint, but the, that doesn't take into account uh, the the making of the tags and and of course the waste. Um, so to say, deposited at sea by the turn. Yeah, yeah, that's that's um, as a as a minor comment. In a previous career, I actually worked in carbon footprinting. So if I do do that, it will include production and disposal or loss footprint of the tags. Um, but in terms of basic economics, GPS tagging actually came out cheaper per required amount of data. Um, because, partly because of this issue of not needing people available when sea conditions were perfect and being unable to use those people when sea conditions were poor. Um, it, was, it was quite interesting and unexpected, actually, that that's the way around the, the economics went. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very interesting. Ah. David, I was going to say, uh, b before, <laughs> before I pass it off for questions to the audience, I... Uh, I um, Overheard you saying that you uh, you thought that these ribs were were death machines. Did you have, do you have a story or something behind being at sea on one of these that we need to be aware of? 
Oh, that was that was actually with um, Inuit hunters in in Greenland who made a point of uh, never slowing down uh, while riding the waves. <laughs> that just that's just the, that's just the adventure of it, David. <laughs> well, no, I know it's very bad for your back. Ah, uh, well. You, uh, yeah, yeah. It took me weeks to recover from the you trip. Ju you just need um, to be young and fit. That's all. Oh yeah, young is the point. <laughs> Um, well, one of my trips back from the Scaries, I actually asked whether we were going to get a 50% discount on the cost of the journey because I'd only spent half the time in contact with the boat. <laughs> <laughs> how far, how far uh, can they, they actually track a, a, sea, a seabird? Because in your study, it was just a few kilometers. Um, how far did they get in, in other studies with the boat? Um, more than 30 kilometers. Mm. Um, you know, one of our birds made it halfway across the Irish Sea before the track terminated. So, you know, they, some of them are going very considerable distances. And, and one of the standard question I, I would guess, uh, I guess is, um, is to say at some stage, will these uh, GPS tags will be small enough that you, you don't need to glue them anymore to the, the back of the birds that you could put them on the leg flag or a ring? I it's a very judging by question. the way tag yeah judging by the way tag technology has been going um and we we've been using glue mounts on a number of species over the last um five years I don't see a time at the moment when a gps tag is going to be leg ring mountable on a turn I don't think their legs are robust enough um, I would hope that the balance that we had to strike between data density and battery depletion, because we, they were quite aggressive schedules. I know they don't look it, but for the combination of battery and solar panel, we set aggr intentionally aggressive schedules. Um, and since then, the efficiency of these micro solar panels has improved and battery technology is gradually improving. So I think for the same weight limit and for the same attachment method, I think even if we ran the study now, we would probably get more data for the intervention that we used. But I can't see them going on leg rings anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, another one from Richard Bevan is, uh, did you think about a harness system? Yes. Um, so, in the UK, I can't speak for other countries, but in the UK, um, attachments to turns have been subject to quite a lot of scrutiny and there have been significant problems associated with harnesses, even temporary harnesses and even elastic harnesses. And we don't yet have a material that we could set a reliable time limit to. You know, and 3% of body weight is actually quite an intervention for a species that's going to fly around the world in the next few months. So a tag attachment that is known to be temporary um, and that we haven't seen any problems from, and I've tagged other species since the Arctic Turn study um, in the same way, is actually quite a valuable issue. Um, of course, the other thing about harnesses is that it's an attractive thought to think that you might get much more GPS data after the bird has left the colony. But because it's a remote download system, once the bird is out of range of the base stations, you're not going to get those data anyway. Um, and the tag isn't capable of archiving 12 months of data and dumping it when it comes back. So the, in this particular situation, for the, for the high resolution data that we wanted, a harness wouldn't have been appropriate. Cool. Thanks, Rachel. And we've got another question uh, from my friend who has informed me to just call him Hamza in order to avoid me making a fool of myself again, trying to pronounce his name. He's asked, uh, just a basic question, do they forage in parties or solo? Thank you, Hamza. Um, in that area and around the colony, they forage in enormous crowds. So I suspect that what happens is that they're picking up from the behavior of the birds around them where there are good feeding sites and very particularly tidal upwelling. So there was a striking tidal pattern to their feeding trick behavior. Um, and when they're foraging, there can be 100 or 200 birds. This is a colony of 3000 birds. 
so you can get a huge crowd foraging and all hitting the sea at the same time and i can see some nodding from people who know turns better than i do <laughs> thanks a lot um okay with that do we have any other questions does anybody have a want to raise their hand and ask a question or have we tied everything up okay i don't see anybody waving at me frantically or raising their hands or throwing anything at the screen so I reckon with that, I can uh, thank you very much for joining us, Rachel. Um, I have to say, I, I did. I was really excited when I saw this paper because you know one of the things we, uh, it's, as David already mentioned, it's a it's a huge sort of gap in our knowledge what the impact is of these tags are on uh, on birds, and we track a lot of birds, um, so it's uh, really fascinating to see this and i think it's great that you've picked that you're working with a species where that allows you to do this i mean obviously you can't imagine trying to follow an albatross uh with, with a rib so um so this is really cool i think it answers some at least opens the door to answering some really uh really interesting questions so and and the much. design uh, yeah and the design i found the design of this of a study also very uh, very neat um in, mm -hmm. in terms of uh also impact on provisioning rates and, and the way you uh, you nested uh, the uh, the design to catch the birds. So uh, very, uh, very valuable contribution. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yep. Um, I'd just like to say there's one interesting compensation that didn't, didn't end up in this paper. I suspect that we're going to have to reanalyze the rest of the behavior data. So there was a compensation in terms of number of trips in time between the tagged bird and its partner. But there was also an apparent compensation in prey size. So the, the tagged birds tended to bring back bigger prey than the untagged birds of a pair. Um, and I mean, there's all sorts of subtleties to the behavioral response, but that does underline this, um, the, the importance, I think, of only tagging one member of a pair at a time, because that permits some very subtle compensations. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I, mean, I guess that that goes to speak a little bit about their flexibility as uh, yeah. as foragers. So we'll uh, actually that's that's quite a nice segue into our next paper, which is on flexibility and foraging of little ox. So Perfect. thanks for joining us. I'm just going to put you on mute now, Rachel, and uh, we'll unmute Nina, who is going to introduce our next paper. Hello, Great, Nina. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so it's wonderful to see everybody from so many places and we happen to have assembled here like the world experts on little ox so this is going to be a great <laughs> conversation um and um <laughs> this is lillian <laughs> um so um and i um what we're going to talk about today is a beautiful paper by um Darek and kasha so chesh Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and just to let you all know, for some of you, um, we all go by a different name for the species. So I'm American and I might refer to it as a dovekey. Some people say little ox, some people say melgune, um, <laughs> a paleosuk. Uh, so it's a one species paper. <laughs> We're all referring to the same thing. So I'll just give a quick summary of a really uh, in-depth and complicated uh, story that um, deserves a, a lot of attention. Um, so this study took place in Hornsund Fjord, which is a fjord in the southwest part of Spitsbergen, and uh, took place over three years, 2011, 16, 2016, and 2018. And um, um, Darek and Kasha made a number of measurements on the little ox. They um, put um, GPS tags on them. So we have an interannual comparison of foraging location, foraging duration. They also um, took the um, chick diet as well as the foraging trip. Um, behavior. So little ox make a number of short trips and then they go for a longer trip, um, which is a trip that includes self feeding and then collecting food for the chick. They have a single chick and they nest in a burrow and um, 
this is really a remarkable study to have done because of the difficulties of working in these conditions um, on these birds. And um, so I'll just tell you briefly the results. One of the main results is that over the three years, there was a huge amount of differences in terms of the oceanographic conditions. So the first year, 2011, was a cold year, which is full the, where the water surrounding the colony was very cold and had ice. And then the other two years were more um, influenced by Atlantic water from the south. So that water is warmer and carries with it a smaller prey that less, has less energy for the little ox. Um, so despite the fact that these three years differed greatly, there were some similarities. The birds on all years brought back a um, iconic uh, copepod, Calanus glacialis, which is an Arctic copepod. Um, it's the main chick diet. Um, they all had pretty good reproductive success over the years, but there was a wide range of differences in terms of the, um, the tracks of the GPS birds. So in the cold year, the GPS birds um, foraged more locally. They um, took back um, this copepod, but also a lot of ice amphipods, Aferusa glacialis. And then in the two later warmer years, they forage more widely and um, appear to be using different features like fronts. Um, and a truly extraordinary thing is some birds making uh, very unexpectedly long foraging trips. So that was a, a really neat um, view of what's happening with them and how they're responding. Um, then with the long trips and the short trips, they had some really unexpected results. Um, there was an idea that we had found in with different colonies, um, in the colonies where they had not very good foraging con conditions, they took longer long trips, which makes sense and that you would think they would take longer to find enough food to replenish their energy. But in this case, the cold year that is sort of the ideal conditions, the long trips were longer. And so I thought that was a, a really um, interesting result. And, um, and then going off of what Rachel talked about with compensation, 2018, was the, a very warm year with sort of poor conditions. Um, and they brought back more food, so compensating perhaps um, during that year. So you can see it's, a, it's an interesting story that has a lot of components to it. Another thing that I think was really new is that as the season went on, the length of time of the short trips increased um, with chick age. And so I thought that was a really interesting result. And then the, um, the, the long trips, um, I think, went in the opposite direction. They became shorter. So that's something that I think we can all talk about here. Um, but I first want to ask you guys, um, you know, there's a gap between 2011 and 2016 and 18. And during that time, you guys redesigned the GPS unit. And I just want you to maybe talk about some of the changes that occurred from the beginning to the, what you came up with at the end. And, um, and and also maybe was that why there was this gap in time? Uh, were you like working on designing this new unit? So, I, and also I wanna say welcome to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good afternoon once more. 
Yeah, it is a, it's a good, good question because uh, the little ochre dovekey is uh, not easy species, species to just GPS tracking because of the very small size. So for a long time, it was not possible to uh, just find such a small device which will be suitable for this species. So yeah, firstly, we, we started the, the, our uh, work with little oaks uh, using GPS loggers in 2009, as far as I remember. So the first model was uh, not very good design. It was a little bit, uh, still a little bit too large comparing to the current models. And also it was the problem that we have to recapture the birds and they were, um, you know, they are not very happy because we have to just stay in the colony and try to, to, to recapture them. So then uh, it was possible to just um, um, a little bit uh, to, to um, uh, to apply the technology which allows us to radio link. So uh, the, the data from the logger is automatically uh, transmitted from the logger. So it was very good for, for birds because they were not um, um, so stressed like before. So it was the, the, the first um, big step to make this a more suitable technology. And then, uh, because uh, we should remember that the little oaks, it's the, the the seabird, which is also diving relatively at, at, um, uh, deeply, so the challenge for projecting the for for inviting the good device is also the high pressure because it's able to go down even up to 50, 60 meters. So it's big pressure. So also the um, building of the sluggers should be very specific. So yeah, the the um, next models were little bit smaller and smaller but still we would be happy to be able to have the even smaller than now so yeah it, it, it's the, st still st still some kind of, of challenge with, with the uh, construction of this logger and why we have some gaps in, in the years because of course it was the question of the funds it's not very cheap equipment so <laughs> we need to <laughs> find some uh, good funds to just cover and also in some uh, seasons we cover on other uh, stages of the uh, of the um, uh, breeding season so in other seasons we focused on the investigation of the um, flights during the incubation and we compared it uh, this strategy during the incubation and during the chick breeding period Thank you. Um, so another question is, so one of the things that you found, which is an amazing insight, is that because the birds returned, even the failed birds, you were able to get tracks on. And that was really interesting because birds that failed did foraging trips that they were released from their obligation of feeding the chick and they went really far to presumably a really productive area. And this occurred during your war one of your warmer years. So um, I thought that was really interesting that they returned to the colony. But one question I had um, was, did they, did the chick, did the nest fail? and then they went off on this long trip like I'm done or did it fail because of those parents going off on the long trip? Do you have any ideas about that? Does that yeah, make it's sense? Not, yeah it's not easy to it's not easy to 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 know for sure what was the reason if this uh, absence of the bird or, or it, it um, uh, it happened a little bit before because uh, we uh, wanted to just limit the number of visits in the colony to just not scare the, the bird inside. So we, we have the, the we even sometimes control the, the nest like each four days or something. So and uh, we don't know that the data after all and uh, we analyzed them months ago. So it's not so easy to to check it. So we, we can only um, link our build notes with, with, with those records of the GPS. So it's very hard to say what was uh, the reason. Um, okay. Although the most parsimonious explanation is like you put the logger on the bird and then the bird fail while anybody else in the colony is pretty successful, then it's like the most parsimonious explanation that this is the, 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 the effect of your uh, tagging. But uh, 
we had uh, this uh, failure only with the very little uh, chicks when uh, they were still brooded, uh, being brooded, and then uh, probably because bird, uh, the, the adults packed with the GPS lovers uh, had been scared and was away for a while, probably that was uh, um, uh, like uh, not, uh, I mean, maybe it, the chick was supposed to be brooded, but it wasn't uh, for a while, and that is why it was dead, and then maybe uh, the bird uh, just didn't, uh, I don't know, maybe it will it come back uh, to the colony, to the nest, and then realize there is nothing and then went to the, uh, to the uh, long trip. So, yeah, we don't know because uh, we don't really want to interfere that much after the tagging. But, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. fortunately it happens uh, rather rarely. Yeah, I was really impressed with how successful, even in poor years the the little ox mm -hmm. are i mean really showing incredible resilience yes um one of the questions i had also was about this short trips the chick feeding getting longer as the chick grew older and you know it could be from a number of reasons one is just more demands made of the ch mm -hmm. to feed the chick both parents are feeding the chick um day and night um and, or it could be that there's local depletion of food around, um, or, um, you know, that the parents are getting tired. Um, I just wondered what your hypothesis was, you know, is that, do we have a Ashmole's halo situation? Do we have uh, uh, just chick energetic demands increasing? Any thoughts about this moving short trip length? I would say that this would be a combination of uh, all the factors you mentioned. Uh, that could be <laughs> because, I mean, we cannot really uh, exclude any uh, anything and point it uh, out uh, like uh, to be uh, and being sure that this is the, the, the main factor uh, responsible for the for the observed pattern. But uh, uh, the one thing is uh, the, the, the chick demands obviously uh, grows over the season. Uh, so it may take uh, more time to get uh, more food. They obviously uh, bring more food uh, in the middle uh, of the chick rearing period compared to the earlier stage. You can tell that uh, by the, I don't know, capturing the birds at the early and uh, later stage and weighing the food samples. And you can also tell that just looking at the birds at the very, very beginning, they've got very little uh, in this color pouch, and then they are like about to explode. <laughs> so uh, the, this amount uh, changes over the time. So that must be the, that may be the reason. And for sure it is. Uh, they extend this duration of the foraging trips, both, uh, I mean, mainly short trips. And then it's also possible that this food uh, depl uh, depletes uh, somehow. Uh, mm -hmm during the, the season because there is a massive uh, uh, number of birds uh, foraging uh, all the, in the colony area. So we don't really know that much about the movement of the zooplankton assemblages. Uh, mm -hmm. The ship which is sampling for us, Oceania, go uh, into the fjord for sampling just once. So we don't really know how it changes over the time. It would be great to have uh, such a transect uh, like at least three times uh, during uh, the breeding season, but uh, yeah, we don't know. We just uh, guessing. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, this, this marine environment is very dynamic, so it's not easy. We we were able to just uh, get access to the data, which are mostly ever average data, and because of the high cloudiness, it's not so easy to find uh, mosaics, satellite mosaics for particular days. So yeah, it's not so yeah. easy to to to, to know. To, to trace the, the, the changes in the, at least environmental uh, conditions or zooplankton density mm -hmm. or other important um, factors. And then, can we talk about these mysterious long trips? So we've come up with these ideas that long trips are long because they're feeding themselves and then collecting food for the chicks and um, one of the things I thought was really intriguing was that in your 2016 years, so you had all the foraging trips were really cold in 2011 and warm in 2018. 
but then in 2016 you had these trips that it seemed like they were both cold and warm like almost like perhaps they go someplace that they're using to feed themselves and then a different place to feed the chick to collect food for the chick what do you think about that as a you know is that something you could resolve with your satellite track i mean your gps track of your birds and because you kept track of the temperatures um so first i think that uh, when i mean for a very long time we didn't really know about the for, uh, long foraging trips uh, is it uh, like uh, they are long be, uh, be, because they go somewhere far from the colony or this is just uh, because they spend a lot of time just foraging resting now we know that this is uh, actually uh, uh, again the combination of the two they both spend more time just resting and feeding on their own and then uh, they also uh, go further and uh, i don't know is it uh, really that obvious they actively go that far uh, from one place uh, uh, from the colony or is it just uh, they are drifting during this uh, this foraging trip yes, of course it's hard to say what they are uh, particularly doing we we know that uh, yeah, because it, it, it was the um, pos um, uh, for foraging um, position, which are just uh, position location of a very um, a low uh, momentary speed. So it's hard to assess if they are actively feeding or just re mm -hmm. uh, resting and drifting. So yeah, it cannot, it cannot be excluded that they do something which would be very unexpected for us. But yeah, it's the, the, the most, uh, for Simonius' explanation, that they just spent more time on uh, more time on on resting and uh, not pro provisioning, because it, it should be expected that in such a good conditions they should have plenty of food, which should be easily available. So there is no um, reasons to think that they have, for example, to spend more time for um, for aging, because, uh, for example, this. Uh, we don't know how it looks, uh, but we can guess that in this marginal ice zone, it's kind of uh, food bonanza, and it should be very easy to, to find a good uh, and good prey. So, and then there is another thing uh, that uh, even if we didn't really look at that, uh, when you look at uh, several graphs, you can see there is a pretty big uh, range of particular values for SST uh, of the foraging uh, spots uh, or the distance uh, of the foraging flights. So uh, we can tell from this data we have, there is a pretty big variety in this foraging uh, flights. And now the question is, uh, is it because of the inter-individual differences, like, I don't know, personality associated differences, or like, a, uh, I don't know, coping style difference, associated with coping styles uh, differences, or is it uh, because uh, of the changes in the environment, uh, the, the birds just adjust uh, their behavior. But uh, this is something what we requires to track the same individual for a longer period of time. And for now, it's not really possible because we need to, we uh, deploy the logger for, uh, um, we don't really have to recapture the bird so we can deploy the logger and then uh, it lasts on a bird for four, five, five to seven days. Four to, yeah, seven days up uh, up to seven days, mm -hmm. and then, but that battery dies after four days. So with four days, you won't really have that many repet uh, repetitions. So I see. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I don't want to take up more time with my questions, but I'd love to hear um, other thoughts and questions from all of you. All right, we, David, do you have anything to say? I, th I think uh, it's, it's really uh, another paper which uh, is, is incredible in the way it shows uh, that little oaks always manage to surprise us and, and how they, they manage to cope with a, a changing environment. And, and uh, Nina will remember this very well because she was the lead author on the paper uh, in, in which we predicted that because of global warming, you know, 40% of uh, North Atlantic little oak colonies would, 
would vanish. And, uh, and then, of course, we went into the field uh, during a PhD of Anne Harding. And uh, at the end of the PhD, comparing little oaks in, in warmer or colder areas, uh, I remember Anne saying, oh, actually, they're fine. Uh, so they, <laughs> they, they, they had this amazing capability of buffering environmental conditions, uh, of course, with limits. Uh, to how far you can, pu you, you can push them, especially if, if uh, global warming is, is then combined with higher contaminant loads, uh, for instance. Um, but uh, with respect to the, the response of the little oaks uh, to uh, global warming, I was, I was wondering, and, and this follows very much on, uh, on what uh, Françoise Amelino developed in her PhD, I was wondering whether uh, we should not be looking at nonlinear responses instead of, of uh, linear responses to global warming. And, and this is really what uh, Francoise developed. She said that probably the way we were looking at little oaks was a, a little too simplistic because we were thinking, well, cold water, everything is fine, and then warming up and things degrade. And, and what she proposed was that you would get actually a, a, quadrat a quadratic uh, response to, uh, to warming with, uh, for instance, in the first phase, um, a warming which could be beneficial, as uh, for instance uh, along the, the coast of East Greenland. And then uh, if you push it uh, towards a certain limit, then things would degrade with further warming. And, and maybe this is what can be observed in, uh, in Spitsbergen. So I was, I was wondering what uh, uh, Darius Kasha and, and Nina think about it. Yeah, that's true. And another thing uh, is uh, like, uh, you've got uh, just a single chick uh, in the brood, uh, which is uh, which simplifies a lot uh, all your predictions. But on the other hand, it push your uh, push the little oaks uh, like a tolerance, tolerance margin uh, very very far. I mean, you need a, a big effect to see uh, a big uh, impact uh, to see the effect in this uh, chick survival. So it's like zero one response. You would expect that, but uh, it's uh, you don't really observe that for a very long time until everything's actually collapse. And then you're right that uh, it's not like uh, they are very good in cold uh, uh, cold conditions and very bad in uh, warm conditions because uh, uh, there is a uh, a lot of things in between going on. And uh, these uh, things in between, they are not like a um, mean of these two extreme states. They are also like a mosaic. And then, and then birds can cope uh, in different ways. And then they can also compensate uh, with uh, other stuff. I mean, they, they are very much focused on uh, Arctic zooplankton because it's uh, energy rich. But on the other hand, they're able to uh, collect enough food if it's uh, super abundant, then they should be still okay. Yeah, but uh, I agree with you, with you that uh, this, uh, like uh, looking uh, at uh, little oaks uh, with a very simplistic uh, um, perspective, uh, it's uh, it doesn't really work. <laughs> I mean, mm. no, it, it reminds me. It reminds me a lot of uh, you know there, there are strong parallels with the work uh, people do on seabirds in Antarctica because initially you know there there were the uh, the papers, for instance, by Wayne Trivelpiece uh, about the um, the incidence of sea ice concentration on on uh, on penguin foraging, uh, which seemed like a straight story, and and then people have been digging into this more and more. And, and for instance, now, you know, the, the team of Jan Roper Couder and, and colleagues, they, they, they have a big project on the impact of, of sea ice on, the, on Antarctic predators. And, and it really shows that the more you dig into this, the more complex it gets. And, and, uh, and, and actually, it's, it's, uh, it's then very difficult to stick to, uh, to simple explanations because it depends a lot on the species, on the conditions, and, and also on these uh, nonlinear uh, responses uh, mm -hmm. we, we've, been, we've been discussing. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, may, maybe that's something because we're so focused on little oaks and the Arctic that we we tend to to forget that uh, there are strong parallels on the other side of, of the globe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, it's not that uh, straightforward. And even with these long and short trips, it's like uh, in Horsund, uh, it's a uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, amazing how consistent birds are in this bimodal strategy. But when we were working in other colonies in Magdalena Fjord and up north, where the conditions are uh, considered to be uh, less favorable, 
uh, this uh, pattern is not that uh, uh, obvious. I mean, sometimes uh, uh, you can see two peaks uh, within this uh, this uh, origin five duration, but sometimes uh, you can see even three peaks, and it's really difficult mm. to, to split and, uh, origin trips. Into and as two. and as you as you know, in East Greenland, we don't get this yeah. bi modality at all, uh, which is yeah, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. which always surprises me. So uh, these guys I, yeah. are really, really flexible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's, always, that's always a surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you look at, the, uh, at, the, at, the, at this species, uh, just for single uh, seasons, you can see clear patterns. Like, I don't know, if we would compare just uh, 2011 with uh, 2018, that would be a pretty simple story. But then uh, we know uh, we've got another season and then we know also uh, other uh, studies from other colonies and other seasons. Mm. And it's not that straightforward anymore. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. especially because Corson is also considered as a kind of optimal place with uh, good environmental conditions. So even if there are some changes, they are not, uh, they are not so huge like in other places. So mm -hmm. still, even if we consider some year as a, let's say, suboptimal, it's sometimes better than in other colonies. So it's also not so easy to, mm, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, very good. But uh, yeah. Yeah. We, should, we, should clearly, we should clearly open for questions from, from the audience. I've, I've, uh, I've been too long already. It's all right. It's an, it's an interesting topic. It's hard, yeah. it's hard not to talk about little ox. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't let me dive into little ox. Yeah. <laughs> um, Richard and Rachel um, both had some questions in the chat. Um, um, so Richard was asking, there'll be a transition when it changes from one parent to two parents. And with two parents, it allows the parents to travel further at that stage. Um, I think that these chicks, they come out so fluffy, they're brooded for a really short time. So almost immediately the two parents are going, going, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, Rachel asked a wonderful question about burrow temperature. Does that vary between cold and warm sea years? You know that. Um, and I think you did have a situation in 2018 where there was rain and the chicks were cold um, and wet, is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In one of the study, we, we, we found um, a relationship be, between the temperature and, yeah, temperature and uh, the, the um, pace of chick um, uh, growth. So, but of course, it's very hard to, um, to, to say that, okay, this, uh, this factor was the most important because in this study, we have no background of uh, number of feedings and other stuff. So it's, um, it, we, we can guess that, okay, it should be very important because um, little hogs are just uh, breeding close to the thermoneutral zone, especially when they are starting the breeding. So very low temperature. So I think that it could, it could somehow affect uh, the, the, the chick growth parameters, but of course it's not so easy to just show that, okay, this is the, the factor which is uh, really uh, the most important because it could be masked by many other factors, like quality and quantity of foods. And then we also noticed that we haven't yet analyzed it properly, but we noticed that uh, in different seasons, uh, birds spend, uh, they, they brood uh, chicks uh, for a different amount of time, like at the beginning, is kind of compulsory like everybody in all the nests they do that all day long and then uh, over the season it's uh, uh, it's um, getting this period in the nest of brooding uh, it's getting shorter and shorter but in some seasons still the parents uh, brood uh, pretty uh, intensively and this is probably related with the outside temperature so and then uh, this uh, parents activity and uh, this brooding activity uh, for sure affects the foraging behavior because this is uh, at the cost of the time that birds can spend mm -hmm. outside okay. of, the sea, uh, of the nest. Uh -huh. cool. Great. Yeah, I, I, had a, I had a really quick question too while you're here and, and mine was mostly about the prey actually and whether or not 
um, is there is there nutritional differences between the the prey that they're getting in the cold years versus the warm years? Like, is a copepod a copepod a copepod, or are there nutritional differences between the various species? Yeah, it's, it's more complicated because both in cold and warm uh, years, the two types of copepods are available. So especially um, um, there are um, different uh, zones with um, in, in which, so one zone is a zone uh, dominated by the warmer Atlantic water masses and the dominant species is the Calanus finmarchicus, so copepod is associated with the warmer waters. And this cold water zone, let's say, with the predominance of the Calanus glacialis, which is associated with cold Arctic water. So even during this cold waters, little algs are somehow masters of finding such a patches of water when still this more caloric Arctic copepods are available. So they can find, for example, some cold water eddies or also the frontal zones between these two kinds of masters are also known as a good place for finding both, both species. So uh, even in, in this uh, warm, so, so even here, it's a, a little bit unexpected uh, result that the highest uh, contribution of the most profitable prey, Calanus glasses, is the highest in the, in the warm year. Because in the cold year, they also um, compensate the food with this um, um, other uh, species, which are uh, sympagic amphipods which are which are associated with the marginal eye zone so they they are really flexible so even in, in the suboptimal conditions they are able to find this preferred cold water um, uh, prey items very cool thanks we've got Davi, one i'm, I'm oh. very surprised Davi, you didn't ask the question that i thought you would which is why no <laughs> why in the warm years the um, are they not feeding in the fjord at the glacier faces, which are rapidly eroding and causing lots of feeding opportunities with osmotically shocked prey? Um, so why are they all going out? I, I just... <laughs> well, it's just, it's just because I'm hoping to get to Hornsund to observe it myself someday. <laughs> <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't want the surprise ruined for him. <laughs> No, I, I have no idea. We will have to ask our Polish friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's strange because uh, we know that um, because we have such a um, hypothesis that sometimes birds should go um, to the other side of uh, Spitsbergen, uh, where, where it's known as a good uh, place for cold water masses. And it's possible, but crossing the, the part of the, uh, of the Spitsbergen, but they never do it. They have some kind of tradition that they have to first <laughs> to go to the open ocean and then sometimes they reach, especially these non-known breeders, they were able to reach this cold water El Dorado, but they do it on the uh, flying around the Spitsbergen. So it's kind of, yeah, maybe they, they have uh, this kind of navigation, which say that never cross the big lands. <laughs> Massive, something like that. So yeah, it's surprising that they, 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 it's possible that they can, uh, for example, forage easily in the in close to the glaciers. So why not inside of the fjords? Right? But they, it's not early. that easy to change such a tradition. If your grandmother, or grandfather were going this way, time, yeah. you cannot really. Uh, choose another one. But I think that uh, they won't really, uh, I mean, that was a hypothesis, uh, they won't really forage in the, uh, in the fjord during the warm season, uh, maybe because uh, during the warm season there is uh, more uh, melting, glacier melting, and then it, it may cause them more uh, so plankton being abundant, but on the other hand, the water gets murky, and it may be difficult, more difficult actually, to to forage on such a uh, on such a um, in such a water. So maybe this is the reason why they really don't go into the fjord during the warm years, but outside. Yeah. We also don't know exactly the way how they detect food, so maybe it's somehow connected with the way how they find the cue where is the good foraging ground. So yeah also a big thing to be investigated in the future. 
-hmm. And as, as Kasha said, there might be a, a limit in terms of turbidity uh, with respect to the fjords they can exploit and, and those where it's just uh, getting too murky for them to, uh, to, catch, uh, to catch prey. So mm -hmm. in that case, you know, some glaciers and, and glacial fronts uh, might be profitable if they're, if they're facing clear oceanic waters. But in other cases, you know, it's all too turbid maybe for them to forage and, and do anything in the fjord. Yeah, there was a study in Horsund. There was a study uh, on this hotspot uh, associated with uh, hotspots for foraging mm -hmm. hotspots associated with uh, glaciers, uh, and this study was performed over the two seasons. And uh, it turned out that uh, uh, some glaciers were like very popular uh, uh, among kittiwakes mm -hmm. and gillamots in one season, but not in the other. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is very uh, uh, season specific and unpredictable actually because the, the the glacier changes and so the water masses over the glacier changes uh, and the, that probably affects this turbidity this uh, this uh, water trans uh, um, uh, how do you call it i mean they need to they probably do you know better because you've been doing this experiment in tanks they you uh, they use vision to 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 uh, to hunt on, on their prey. Uh, even if they suck the spray, they first need to somehow locate this uh, cloud of the zooplankton. Uh, unless so unless uh, the copepods make uh, a lot of noise underwater and in, in 10 years yeah. will work out that they actually can hear them. Yeah, yeah. But then the glacier actually may, may, uh, may uh, disturb that. I mean, if this is like a because the glacier uh, releases uh, air bubbles, mm. so it's very, very noisy. <laughs> so yeah, it may right. also yeah. the reason why they don't really want to forage in this area. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so we've got one more. I think we've got time for another quick question. We've got uh, one from Rachel in the chat who's asked if you've considered using cameras to observe feeding visits remotely. Um, and can you assess the guller pouch size from images? Mm, yes and no. <laughs> I said already that uh, we uh, we can tell the size the, the size difference in this gular pouch. Uh, like at the very beginning, it's very small, and then at the uh, at the end uh, of the um, I mean in the mid uh, cheek rearing period is bigger. But the problem is uh, like you can tell the difference between very small gular pouch and very big gular pouch, but I think it's tricky to measure it precisely because uh, it's kind of soft yeah. and uh, it uh, the size very much depends on the bir bird's uh, posture. So if it's it stand if it stands on its uh, long legs, <laughs> it uh, you may have an impression of very uh, uh, of very little foot uh, mm -hmm. inside. But uh, if it's uh, like just sitting, then you may uh, have an impression it has a lot. So mm, I'm not it's, really sure if that works. But uh, may, it may work if you if you build uh, categories and not uh, a linear scale. So, so yeah, if you, yeah. Have, mm -hmm. if you have discrete categories, you know you could have a girl approach uh, one to four. Um, yeah. may, maybe that could work. Uh huh. Yeah, but on the other hand, it's a problem that they interrupt um, feeding. So they are um, going inside of the nest burrow, then going back. So mm. at the beginning, they will have full gar punch, and after such a free interrupted feedings, they will have only the small amount. So mm. and then also with this uh, grouping, uh, uh, cat with, with, with these categories, uh, you are losing uh, resolution, and then you may not really be able to measure anything. I mean, you may tell that it's not that much, that uh, then uh, there is a lot, but it doesn't really tell you anything because uh, it's too not uh, accurate enough. Uh, without any calibration. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, very cool. All right, well, I think with that, it's uh, quarter after six in the UK, which means it's dinner time for us <laughs> in this part of the world. That's the little oak effect. That's the little oak effect. The little, uh, the little oak effect. An, uh, an, an additional uh, quarter of an hour to the session just because yeah. of little oaks. Yeah, it's about flexibility, say, right? Thank, thank you, uh, Grant and David, for um, for asking me to 
come and speak with all of you. This has been really fun and to see people from all over the world um, and of all ages and stages of the career, it's really exciting. I love the conversation. And thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today, Nina. Thanks a lot. See you next yeah. week. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. And again, we'll be back next week. Next week, we're going to be switching over to our, our other time zone. So we'll be on at 0630 GMT, which is 730 in the morning <laughs> in the, in the UK, bright and early. And uh, yeah. And uh like we'll uh, we'll have the Zoom link and everything online. Follow us on Twitter. Um, and if you do know some people who are keen in being involved um, and joining in on the conversation, please just uh, forward them the information. Um, please feel free to share as much as you can to uh, get some more people on. It would be great to see some other faces from around the world. Um, and again, thank you, Rachel, for joining us. Uh, and thank you to our Polish colleagues who have joined us today. It was lovely to see everybody. Thanks for the great papers. Um, and with that, we'll sign off. So stay inside, stay safe, wash your hands, don't get sick. <laughs> and take care, everyone. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Great to see you. Bye. -bye.